20th Century Boy. My name is Mike Chemical Romance. (laughs) And this is the inside of my mind. All right. Welcome to the show. Uh, Mike Chemical Romance. Of course, every week on the show, I start with a different name. Asked you guys for a bunch of uh, submissions this week. And Patreon Kyle, who is a, a Patreon member of this show, actually suggested Mike Chemical Romance, which I thought was very, very clever. So I wanted to use it. Send in your name if you want uh, your name for me read out on the show, I suppose. Well done, Kyle, again. Uh, Of course, my name is actually Radio Mike, and uh, I'm a writer and producer from here in Melbourne, Australia, just trying to make his way through life. And this is my podcast, 20th Century Boy, a podcast that's just kind of like the conversations you wish you were having about the stuff that nobody else cares about, you know. All the stuff that's swirling through your mind, I assume, if you're anything like me, that you just want to be talking about with your friends, but you're just not, that's what this podcast is for. It's a weekly one-sided, one-hour conversation with me. You can't respond. Well, you can. You can contribute to the show anytime, radiomikepod at gmail.com. Send an email there or send a voicemail attached to that. Or you can just DM me on Instagram, any thoughts, at radio.mike, Twitter, at It's Radio Mike, tweet about the show, let me know what you're thinking, let me know your thoughts, feelings, recommendations, queries, questions, concerns, compliments, complaints, whatever, all of the above really. I love hearing from you. I would love to have some more voice messages on the show and I will plug it again. You can call the show and leave a voicemail anytime from anywhere in the world on this phone number. If you've got a contribution to the podcast, there's only one number you see. Go one it hundred for free and free for free. Been a very busy week this week uh, and been doing a lot of cool stuff, which has been fun because cool stuff is always fun. But, uh, well, I wanted to just sort of get started with uh, one of these bad boys. All the Ryan's that you sent in. This is uh, basically all the write-ins, basically stuff that you guys, listeners of the show, have sent in during the week, generally about last week's show. But I do implore you, if there's anything you want me to talk about, any questions you want me to answer, etc., just, again, write them in. Send me a message. Nowadays, on the at TCB pod Instagram, just before, the day before I record the show, I just put up anything you guys want me to talk about. And I'm now taking content contributions from there. So just let me know. I will talk about anything. Patreo quack. That's Christina with a K, uh, one of our longest serving Patreon members. And you can sign up to the Patreon, patreon.com slash Radio Mike to get two bonus podcasts every month. Would love to have you there. Um, Sorry, two bonus podcasts every week. So it's eight bonus podcasts a month. Jump on. It's really good. Uh, Last week, I talked about how Nick Offerman said on the Jimmy Fallon show that uh, he loves the game Banjo-Kazooie, one of my favorite games. Patreon Quack said, I'm not a big gamer, but me and my little brother used to play the crap out of Banjo-Kazooie on the Nintendo 64 and recently have restarted it on the Switch. And I'm having so much fun because I can, I even can do things in the game because even, even I can do things in the game and it's even just fun to watch it being played. It is a great game. It's cool. It's now playable on the Switch. Um, if you have a Switch, I recommend playing it. And Patreon Beth, another Patreon supporter uh, and also a fan of Banjo-Kazooie. She says, same, I love Banjo-Kazooie when I was little. I don't think we ever actually had it. I think I used to just play it at my cousin's. Was so excited when it became available on the, on the Switch. This is a conversation that came out of the podcast Discord. Uh, there's about 200 people in there just chatting all kinds of topics, uh, talking about this pod, talking about video games, talking about movies, books, music and etc so jump in the discord if you would like to be there we would love to have you okay we got a bunch of things to get through today and a bunch of things that I want to slash need to talk about uh and I suppose the first thing that I want to give you all an update on is a segment that I will be doing throughout all of 2023 and it's this Get ready to rock, because it's Mike's big year of live music. And events. 
yeah, it's Mike's big year of live music and events. Uh, started off as just Mike's big year of live music. Then I started going to just like events generally. And I was like, well, why not make it Mike's big year of live music and events? So it is Mike's big year of live music and events. And uh, I've been to a few events and zero live. Actually, no, I've been to one live music and two events in the last week, which was a lot of fun. And I wanted to like detail it because that's the whole point of Mike's big year of live music and events. It's to uh, highlight all of the cool things you can do and that I have done. So you should be lo- more like me, I suppose. Um, no, went to this event at the Sydney Maya Music Bowl here in Melbourne. Always found the name Sydney Maya Music Bowl very con- con- uh, confusing because of course it is in Melbourne, but it's the Sydney Maya Music Bowl, but it's not Sydney as in named after Sydney the city. It's named after a guy called, I assume, Sydney Maya and it's spelled S-I-D, not S-Y-D like Sydney the city is. Anyway, with all that o- over... Went to this free event at uh, the Sydney Maya Music Bowl. Again, Sydney Maya, not Sydney the city. And it was the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra playing Tchaikovsky. Free classical music event. Didn't think there'd be many people there because I genuinely wasn't sure if there was a market for classical music anymore. Turns out there is because there were 10,000 people at Sydney Maya Music Bowl listening to the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra playing Tchaikovsky songs, his greatest hits, the greatest hits of classical composer Tchaikovsky, who admittedly has some classic hits. One of my favourites, which I did hear live on the night, and boy, oh boy, it is quite uh, fantastic to listen to an actual proper orchestra playing live. Like, we all have that experience of being at high school and listening to, like, the junior school orchestra playing the shittest songs of all time, right? I mean, sorry, we might not all. If you went to a, a... private school like me you probably had a school with a junior orchestra where like 10 year olds are playing violin and trumpet and everything in the middle and just it's awful but a proper symphony orchestra the melbourne symphony orchestra who i have seen a few times before was amazing i actually saw them like maybe five or six years ago there was an event at the exhibition center here in melbourne where the symphony orchestra played um Pokemon music. They just did a Pokemon night where they played all music from the Pokemon games as well as the anime theme song. Like, it's really good. They've got one coming up where they're playing the score to Harry Potter and the Deathly Yellows Part 2 um, while you watch the movie. Like, they do that. They do that with Star Wars, Indiana Jones, like lots of movies. You watch the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra play the music while you watch the movie. And I think that's really, really cool. So I can't wait for that. But Tchaikovsky has this incredible... Um, song, I guess, which is, he wrote the Swan Lake Ballet. I'm definitely butchering whatever it is, but like the Swan Lake thing, um, you might recognize the, the, the sound of it. And they did play, play it live. It was really beautiful. And the reason I know that and I like it so much is because it's a cr- it's a core plot point. That song and that ballet is a core plot point in one of my favourite movies of all time, Billy Elliot. If you haven't seen Billy Elliot, either the movie or the musical, I've not seen the musical, but if you haven't seen the movie, phenomenal film. Just an absolute phenomenal film. Um, of course, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the story. You know, he comes from like a conservative mining town. His dad's a very like macho man. He uh, is sent to boxing classes, but ends up doing ballet classes. And then his dad is really angry because boxing is, because uh, ballet for men is like not allowed in this conservative mining town. And it's all just really ahead of its game in terms of talking about, um, I suppose, like uh, homophobia. And it's very progressive for the age that it is talking about a lot of issues. And I just think it's a phenomenal film with also an incredible soundtrack. Uh, If you're a hardcore listener of this podcast, go and look at the soundtrack of Billy Elliot um, because I think you will see that it influenced me a lot. I think you will, if if you can do the math, um, go and watch that movie. But yeah, Swan Lake, amazing. And there's that great scene sort of at the end of Billy Elliot where He's now grown up and he's gone to ballet school and he's now performing the lead role in Swan Lake. And if you've seen the film, you will probably remember this moment. 
that was really fun. It was just a nice night, like just sitting and listening to classical music, having a drink, like really, really fun. The other two, th- the, the other thing I went to that I wanted to talk about a little bit. So uh, it, it was, I went to with my uh, dad, my mum, and my nonna, um, who I probably want to play a little bit of audio from nonna. We went to see the Phantom of the Opera. Here's me and nonna talking about it. All right, nonna, we're going to see Phantom of the Opera. Send them in the I love that. And honestly was really curious to see this. It's, it, it, it was at the um, Arts Centre uh, in Melbourne and was really curious to see it because it's such a, I feel like the Phantom of the Opera is such a pinnacle of pop culture, right? Like it's just uh, as an artifact, as an opera, as a musical, like everything about it, I feel like everyone is familiar with it, but I don't think many people of our generation have seen it. And that's why I really wanted to see it because I've heard so much about it seen so much about it in pop culture um and i was like what's it like what is it about i need to see this i need to understand it my only like two pop culture references that immediately come to mind are both from the simpsons the first one is this moment can i be the phantom of the opera dad the phantom isn't in this but i do a great impression of him Mm, i am the gayest super villain ever beware my scented candles who scented maybe a little bit of a dated gag from Homer Simpson there. And of course the episode where um, this happens, it's an episode set in the future where Lisa gets married to the British guy. And then they talk about how Martin uh, died and then it goes underground and you see Martin and this happens. Not quite perished my lady love. Although some days I wish I had. never really fully understood that of course martin in that scene is dressed as the phantom of the opera and i actually just put it up on twitter because i wanted to talk about it and i just said can anyone explain what the why this moment in the simpson is funny i understand it's parroting phantom of the opera but i don't understand the significance of the song that martin plays now special shout out to Guy Davis, who has been on an episode of Mike Talks and is a co-host on the Four Finger Discount podcast, who clarified it for me. Um, he says, because he says uh, the, the song that's being played by Martin there is a song called A Fifth of Beethoven, which is a, uh, disco, a disco song that samples Beethoven's music. And uh, he says, I guess it's just the Phantom of the Opera is always presented as this somber, sophisticated lover of high art and playing a fifth of Beethoven runs counter to that. So finally, I understand that joke. Thank you very much, uh, Guy from Four Finger Discount for clearing that up. But really, really enjoyed it. It's it's quite scary at points and I'm still sort of dissecting and analysing in my own head the meaning of the Phantom of the Opera. Like I'm still trying to figure out like a bunch of the metaphors and whether the Phantom himself is a metaphor. I have been made aware that it was a novel before being a musical. Uh, Again, was not aware of that. Did not know it was a novel. And apparently the musical or the opera musical takes a few liberties with the ambiguity of the Phantom of the Opera, who, if you don't know, you know, the Phantom of the Opera is this weird guy who lives in the sewers in a lair in like an 80s sex dungeon style lair under the opera house and falls in love with one of the singers takes her to the lair you know trains her how to sing and then like starts killing people when she doesn't get the lead role and stuff like that there's that famous scene that I feel like everyone's seen where the phantom is on like the gondola in the sewers taking her into the underground lair which is really creepy i've always found the character creepy that martin grab from the simpsons used to scare me so much as a kid something about the mask the the half mask on the face just a really really weird but also really fun i started watching the movie as well just to like sort of get it more in my head but i found it really I mean, the performance was phenomenal. Some opera singers, like, it's not really my style of musical, but, like, opera singers, you got to hand it to them. They are so good at their craft and so in control of their voices. But, yeah, I found the Phantom character, like, there's, I guess there's one moment at the very end that, in the musical at least, that makes it kind of ambiguous as to whether he was real or not, or as, or like if he's just a normal guy or if he's some kind of actual phantom or spirit of the opera or something like that. And it was, it really made me think a lot about 
what was going on and what the kind of analogies were. The lead song, though, is such a banger. Here's the, like, sort of Phantom of the Opera theme. like about it so this musical i think came out in 1982 or maybe 1980 what i like about it is like it starts off with those really hard um spiky almost sorry i just dropped my phone if anyone heard that because i read the run sheet for this show off my phone just gonna pick it up um has those really spiky organs right that just like those real horror transylvania you know the real horror tropey organ <laughs> You know, those kinds of sounds. And then you kind of just, then it get into the actual verse melodies of that song. It just ends up sounding like a very, very 80s sort of like soft rock 80s new wave song. Like, it kind of also reminds me of the theme song to the movie Never Ending Story. Like just in vibe. I, maybe I'm just grasping onto straws here, but it reminds me of that. I'll put some of that in here as well. But yeah, really enjoyed uh, the Phantom of the Opera. I thought it was cool. Would be interested if anyone is like a fan. I, I'm pretty sure a few people messaged me when I put it up on my story. I'd love to have a bit more analysis of what you think the Phantom means. And finally, uh, last night uh, and last year, of course, was Mike's big year of premieres, trying to go to as many movie premieres as possible. Went to the premiere of Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania. Um, now... Would be really interested for Marvel fans to hear what you all think of this movie. I honestly, and I by this by the time this is out, I'll have a proper review up on YouTube. So go and look at. But my my general thoughts are that it is just the goofiest, wackiest Marvel movie we've ever gotten. There is so much CGI and green screen. Like, it is just so obvious. Um, it, it felt like that this was done on more of a budget, maybe, than other Marvel films, which makes sense. But overall, the the lighthearted tone, the goofiness, the, the wackiness of it, I actually really enjoyed. And setting up the new sort of big bad of the Marvel Universe, like the new, the new Thanos, setting him up, it's Kang the Conqueror, I think... They did a really good job setting that character up, and I'm and it and it kind of made me excited about seeing that character in the next phase of Marvel because I don't even like I'm thinking about the Marvel movies that have come out recently and like none of them has stood out to me. I didn't I haven't seen Black Panther two yet. I should watch that in the next few years, but the next few weeks rather. But yeah, I I actually quite enjoyed Ant Man, but I have a feeling it's going to get really mixed reviews. Um, and again, I'm not a film critic. I'm just a guy who likes going to see movies and generally does like blockbuster movies. I'm not a snobby artistic uh, film critic. So if you didn't like the movie, don't come at me. There's enough online vitriol <laughs> targeted against me that I don't need you guys uh, getting in on that. A few other things. So that was Mike's big year of live music and events. And oh, and Friday night, I... It continues tomorrow night from day of release. Mike's big year of uh, live music and events continues when I go to see Richard Dawkins uh, in conversation. And uh, if you're not familiar with Richard Dawkins, he is a writer and uh, philosopher and scientist who, um, you know, is... I guess he's a lot... He, his biggest work, The God Delusion, is about, um, you know, why he believes that the prospect of God in inverted commas existing is impossible. And it's, it's quite a good read. And I understand like a few, uh, uh, well, I'm sure a lot of people who listen to this podcast are um, religious and that's great. Um, I have just always really respected Richard Dawkins's speaking um, style, um, his matter of factness. And I think he's just very well articulated. Go and watch some of his videos on YouTube. So 
Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. I just bought a ticket for myself. It's just something I'm going to go to by myself because I just really like him and I really wanted to watch him speak. So yeah, I'm looking forward to that. His, uh, his wisdom is uh, really valuable, I believe. A few more things. This is going to be a real kind of movie related episode because there's a few things that have sort of emerged in the pop culture space over the last week or so that just yearn for my attention. And the first one, and boy, I'm so not excited to be talking about this and long-time listeners of this show will know why. It has come to my attention that a Michael Jackson biopic film <laughs> is in development. Bam, it's happening. Now, the, there is one thing on that I've done on the internet that got me more hate more vitriol and more death threats than anything else I have ever said. And I, and I find it really funny. And that is that it is a well-known fact that Michael Jackson was almost certainly a pedophile. If he wasn't a pedophile, he was definitely a really weird, creepy dude. Now, I did, basically I made the point on this podcast last year, Rolling Stone did a cover piece on Harry Styles after his album Harry's House came out, saying that he was the new king of pop, like just in a tongue-in-cheek kind of way. My point was, yeah, why not? Because Michael Jackson, A, the form, Michael Jackson, the former king of pop, or the current king of pop, I suppose, depending on how you want to look at it, A, is dead, B, was a pedophile. Now, Don't get me wrong, guys. It doesn't mean I don't think Michael Jackson has some pretty fucking good songs. Beat it. Amazing. Bad. Amazing. Man in the Mirror. Amazing. Smooth Criminal. You guessed it. Amazing. He has some good songs. Thriller. Another good one. Michael Jackson has a lot of very good songs and was a fantastic musician. I don't want to get torn to shreds to this for this. So I'm going to pass the blame on to someone else, guys. Because... I saw this come up from a TV show on Channel 7 here in Australia called Sunrise, hosted by everybody's favourite person on Australian TV, David Koshy Kosh. Koshy, when talking about the Michael Jackson biopic being released, said something that I found (laughs) really, really funny. But we don't know who else is involved. Yeah. Okay. It is amazing. There's no doubt one of the greatest talents of all time mm. is a pedophile. Yeah. So, <laughs> what? I love the response. From, so that was live on, on Australian TV. I, I assume Sunrise has a live studio audience or those are just the crew laughing at what he said. But I love how whoever is in the background, whether it's audience or crew laughing, they're acting like it's like the most of it, like, like, oh, I can't believe he went there. Like, like, like oh, I can't believe he said that. It was like, oh, did I miss a memo? Did I miss this memo? Because I thought we all knew and accepted at like some point in the last 20 years that Michael Jackson was almost certainly a pedophile. That's what I thought. But you got people like Koshi saying, oh, well, you know, like what I would consider a very rational view of the situation like exactly what I've been saying yes there is no doubt in my mind that Michael Jackson is a fantastic performer and has some great songs I just listed them off bad thriller smooth criminal man in the mirror they don't really care about us that's another great Michael Jackson song god he's good but on the other hand he was a pedophile and I'm not gonna clip this up for TikTok because that's what's gonna get me killed because of the sheer amount of death threats I got last time. Like, you know, s- direct your hatred to David Koshy Kosh. Cancel Koshy. Koshy is over party. Hashtag. Get him out of here. But seriously, I just found it so funny. Like, you know, he, he was a pedophile, and everyone's like, "What? That's the mo- That's what everyone thinks." I think everyone in the world, well, clearly not, but I think most people would say Michael Jackson's music was really good. He was a really good performer. But on the other hand, he was a pedophile. Michael Jackson's in real life nephew is also playing him in the the show. The whole thing is so funny, but I, I genuinely am so unsurprised that they're making this movie, you know, after they've done... Bohemian Rhapsody, Rocket Man, all of them. What's the other one? Elvis, you know. When I do think about, like, p- 
people who were such enormous figures of music, these are all the people I think of. Freddie Mercury, right? Elvis Presley. Um, like more in my parents' generation, like before I was born. You know, Freddie, Elvis, yeah, Elton John, you know, Michael Jackson definitely sits in that group. He's also a pedophile, you know? Sort of like Mike's big year of live music and events. Michael Jackson was a really good artist and a pedophile, right? It's the same principle. (laughs) I'm wondering who there'd be a biopic of maybe in 20 years for like our generation. Like, would we get an Ed Sheeran (laughs) biopic? But I just, I actually feel like the Ed Sheeran biopic would be really boring only because Ed Sheeran genuinely seems like a delightful dude who like, as far as I can tell, hasn't had heaps of controversy in his life and career. So I just think the Ed Sheeran biopic would just be a nice movie, not like plagued with like the Elton John stuff where he was like on heaps of drugs and shit, you know, all of that. I just, yeah, I guess Ed Sheeran, I mean, Eminem, but he kind of did do one with 8 Mile. He was just playing a fictionalized version of himself. Maybe Beyonce, Rihanna, I don't know. Send in who you who would you like to see a biopic of in in the music world? Who's an artist now that you're like like maybe would would Bieber get one? Probably I don't know, but but they will happen. Like I'm telling you, in 20 years, in season 25 of 20th Century Boy, we'll be talking about something. One of these. Uh, Radio Michael Lay over on the TCB Pod Instagram and and as well as a few others. Uh, wanted me to talk about the new trailer for the Flash movie, the new DC Flash movie. Um, I'll talk a little bit about it, spoiler free, but I'll more talk about my thoughts generally on the film. If you're not aware, it stars Ezra Miller. Ezra, uh, who has played the Flash in other films such as the Justice League film from DC, Uh, they have been accused of many, many sort of misdoings involving um, assault, battery, um, grooming of children, of underage people and, um, well, yeah, children and uh, a bunch of pretty serious stuff. And the film, as far as I am aware, uh, which was which was going to be a pretty massive release for the DC movie universe, like a pretty crucial release. It features some prominent actors and characters in the universe and... It's been ready for a very long time, but then Ezra Miller started doing all this crazy shit and they had to pause on releasing the film. Now, they're finally releasing it after being quiet about it for a very long time. It's coming out soon. My thoughts on it, I mean, it looks like a great movie. I'll definitely see it. I like The Flash. I've always really liked The Flash as a character. I don't know why. I just I just think The, the Flash as a character is really interesting um, it's a cool power. You know, we, we've seen a lot of super speed based powers in films, particularly with Quicksilver in X-Men and even Sonic from Sonic the Hedgehog live action movies. Like they do the whole slow down time thing and the, you know, you've all probably seen it, but yeah, really excited as to what, what Flash could be, but it is very fascinating to me how much of a crisis Warner Brothers and DC must have been in when Ezra Miller started doing all this stuff that they were accused of doing and um, becoming essentially a PR nightmare that prevented them from actually releasing the film. And what I find very interesting is that they, I mean, they kind of just had to wait out the storm. They had to basically, because they had already finished shooting the film. They had already injected all all of this money into the movie. So this movie is finished. Warner Brothers has this product, but they can't release it in such a turbulent time for the lead actor in the film, right? So they just have to hold it. Now, a lot of people were saying, well, maybe that movie just never comes out. Of course, never going to happen in a in a capitalist society when Warner Brothers has this product they've invested millions and millions of dollars into, they're never going to be like, nah, we can't release it ethically because Ezra Miller is almost objectively a bad person. They can't do that. So they just had to weather it out, weather the storm. And now they're going, okay, it's kind of settled down a bit. There hasn't been any big news about it. Ezra's seeking help for their mental health. We've got to um, put this film out and make a return on our investment. I find it very, very, very interesting for a number of reasons. But, you know, if we're talking about 
problematic people, problematic creators, problematic um, studios, problematic things, which I think is something that we lean into the semantics of a lot um, unnecessarily in today's culture. More on that on this week's Patreon bonus overflow episode, which is up now, by the way. Go and get it, patreon.com slash radio mic. I just think it's very interesting. It's a very interesting move because I think ethically knowing what this lead actor is accused of doing, they, at the end of the day, I reckon if they hadn't shot the film, they may have either abandoned it or recast Flash. But because they have finished the film, they have no choice now but to stand behind it and make their investment back regardless of what Ezra Miller has been accused of doing. Very fascinating case. Let me know your thoughts on it. I'd be very interested. RadioMikePod at gmail.com would be very interested to hear what people think. The other kind of movie reveal or, yeah, reveal that we got over the last week has got to go down in history for one of the most bizarre and shocking movie reveals ever, but also at the same time not. And I wanted to talk about it because Disney announced that Pixar is officially making Toy Story 5. Boom. I find this so stupid. I mean, unsurprising, which I'll get to, but Toy Story for me is a very fascinating case study of um, where commercialism outweighs creative integrity and intent, right? Because... We all know the story. We all know the Toy Story. So Toy Story 1 comes out. It's one of the first 3D animated films of all time. It's overwhelmingly critically acclaimed. It makes a lot of money. It's a very popular film. Still to this day regarded as a phenomenal film. A few years later, great, let's do another one. They do Toy Story 2, also a great movie, similar acclaim, similar commercial success, and then Pixar moves on to other projects. Until 10 years later, they announce Toy Story 3. Great kind of... Great kind of uh, thinking pattern with it, though. They set it 10 years after Toy Story 2 so that all the children who grew up watching Toy Story and all the children who were the same age as the boy in Toy Story, Andy, when those movies came out, are now still the same age as Andy. They're now adults. They're now 18, 19, 20, right? Genius. And we've all seen Toy Story 3. Again, critical acclaim, commercial success, etc. And I think we can all agree Toy Story 3 was a pretty perfect ending for that saga. And it certainly felt... uh, I guess it it, it really felt... um, like a neat little package to end it. It was bittersweet. It was a very sad ending. It was a very... um, heartwarming and heart-wrenching ending to that franchise. And I remember seeing it in the cinemas when it came out, I think in 2010, and being like, that was great. Like, what a great fitting closing of this chapter of all of our lives, all of us 90s kids who watched Toy Story and Toy Story 2 as kids, and now we're grown up and we're seeing the third one. Beautiful, just beautiful. So it was to my complete disdain when they announced that they were doing Toy Story 4, which I believe came out three years ago now, maybe. And here am I, I think I talked about Toy Story 4 on this podcast when I went to see it. I think, I mean, it must have been the first season of this podcast. And I remember enjoying it. And I also remember the move, the the, the ending being similar to number three, like heartwarming, heart-wrenching, sad, beautiful, tear-jerking, bittersweet, all of the above. But at the same time, every thought I've had about it since, retrospectively, is that it was just an unnecessary sequel. And I appreciate where it ended up, but I still think it was an unnecessary sequel. But if that's going to be the ending of the Toy Story saga, I am happy with that ending, okay? If you... Spoilers... Woody goes to become a free toy, right? No owner with Bo Peep. And Buzz and the other toys go back 
to Bonnie, the, the girl that now owns them, I believe. And there's this beautiful moment at the end of that movie where, you know, it cuts, Woody is, Buzz is, dry, like, they're going away from Woody and Bo Peep, waving goodbye. Buzz says to infinity, Woody says and beyond. Beautiful moment, end of movie. Okay, I am happy for that to be the final uh, chapter of the Toy Story story, if we must have that. Even though Toy Story 3 was probably a better place to leave it. Now they're doing Toy Story 5. File this under unnecessary sequels. Did a lot of ranting last year on the podcast about unnecessary prequels, but unnecessary sequels, this is one of them. They're also doing a Frozen 3 and a Zootopia 2. Again, two movies I knew, two movies I don't want to see and don't care about. That being said, like I I I my friend Dave Lee from Dave Lee Down Under the YouTube channel has also done a mic talks was um, made a really interesting point on Twitter that he actually was copying a lot of flack for, but I got to say, I completely agree with him. Disney recently put out a movie called Strange World in cinemas, and it was a commercial flop. It is one of Disney's biggest failures. I think it is Disney's biggest commercial failure of all time. I bet most of you haven't seen it. Some of you probably haven't even heard of the film because the marketing behind it was terrible. Um... Dave Lee actually did a great video on his channel about how it became the biggest flop of all time. And Dave Lee made this really funny point, and I've talked about this kind of thing on the pod before. He was like, everyone is complaining, including me, everyone is complaining about Toy Story 5, Zootopia 2, Frozen 3. Everyone's complaining about those movies and saying, why can't they have more original ideas? But then when they did put out a movie that was an original idea nobody saw it and it became their biggest failure of all time. Which is where I get onto that point of um, commercial integrity versus creative integrity, right? Sorry, commercial gain versus creative integrity because we know in this society, again, money is the ultimate goal. Yes, these movies are here to entertain us, but at the end of the day, they just want, they want to make money. That's their goal. And Strange World in particular is a really good learning for Disney to be like, uh, like if you're a shareholder... You're saying to Disney, hey, no more Strange World. Toy Story's printing money. Frozen is printing money. Make more of that. Those brands are so well known. Those brands are so well loved by kids. Make more of them. We don't want Strange World because we lose money on Strange World. I think they lost $250 million on that movie. So if you're a shareholder or an executive at Disney... You're saying make more Toy Stories, make more Zootopias, make more Frozen, make more Monsters, Inc., make more fucking The Incredibles, make more The Lion King. You know, that's all they think about. And when these new movies come out and flop, like Strange World did, ultimately it means we're going to get less and less original movies. So I guess if there is a movie that you haven't heard of and is not based on an existing property, go and see it. Because... That's how we keep creativity alive. Now, I'm sure I'm definitely going to see Toy Story 5. Tim Allen has confirmed he's back as Buzz Lightyear, but and I think that's cool. But yeah, I'm definitely going to see it whenever it comes out. I'm sure I'll enjoy it. I just think it's unnecessary. But in the world we live in, that I suppose is the price. Gone for had a few really good rants here that I found really interesting. I hope you have too. Um, last week I put out to you guys, the listeners, for best songs of all time. Uh, might make a little opener for this for next week because I want to keep it going. Send in what you think is the greatest song of all time. Um, had a few more in this week, and I wanted to play some of them for you now. Got one in from Radio Red Shoes, who actually said, "Take on Me" by Aha. I mean, I got to say, that song is just the quintessential 80s, isn't it? That song just feels so 80s. It feels, I don't know, I love that song. I love the falsetto vocals. I feel like they are so iconic. Um, I love everything about that song. I actually went on to YouTube to just look up the music video because it's quite an iconic music video as well. It's got over a billion views on YouTube, which feels like a fair bit. That's a great classic song. Now, uh Radio in Brentive actually suggested Africa.
It was recently covered by Weezer, like, a, well, recently, like five years ago, and it went pretty viral. I don't know. I mean, that's definitely a good song. For me, no, definitely not the greatest ever in that, but I do think, actually, like, I can see why someone would think that, though, because it is, that that chorus generally is so iconic. It's quite a beautiful song. Yeah, I really like it. Uh, from Radio David, he submitted Kids by MGMT. <laughs> I actually think it, this is a really iconic song because I, at the time this came out, which I'm going to say it's from the album Miraculous Spectacular. I'm going to say it came out maybe in 07, 08. Really good album, by the way. That song was so unique. Like, I mean, I know it harkens back to, again, like 70s and 80s, but you didn't hear, you didn't hear much like that back then. It was very novel for my generation. And even those like arcadey, like sort of beats behind, like, dur, 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 you know, that melody I feel like is super iconic. And that, yeah, that song definitely is, is amazing. Definitely up there. And finally from uh, Radio JJ, Iris by the Goo Goo Dolls. <laughs> Interesting submission, only because this is one of those songs, when I saw it on Instagram written in by Radio JJ, it's one of those songs that you, that like, I didn't know, I know this song, I don't wanna do, I know the song, didn't know the name or the artist. You know, there's just those songs where you're like, oh yeah, I know this song, but I could not tell you the name of this song. One that I used to be for me was um Semi Charmed Kind of Life. Is that what it's called? I want something new. That song, always knew it and loved the song, but I never knew what it was called or who it was by. Now I do, Third Eye Blind. But um, yeah, those send, send them in. Just send them in with any correspondence. Let's get a collection going. I'm going to start a playlist on Spotify of uh, the Radio Family. That's the collective li- group of listeners of this show and their favourite songs. And I think uh, I would love to have your guys' contributions in there. Okay, Um I think that's a pretty good show, but let's finish it up by doing one of these bad, 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 bad boys. The plug. Uh, Jump on the Patreon, patreon.com slash radio mic to get the bonus podcasts, which are A, the TCB Overflow, which is up now. And I'm going to be talking more about, um, on this week's one, I'm going to be talking about online discourse, um, Twitter, uh, political discourse in 2023, and my thoughts on all of the above. Um, It's an interesting one. Would love to hear your thoughts. And then every Friday, there's the Pat and Mike show where Pat and I dig a little bit deeper on one of the topics. Pat really wants to deep dive on the Toy Story 5 thing. So we're going to be doing that. Plus we, you know, have a bunch of laughs. uh, Pat was actually away last week. So Zach Miller, my friend, filled in for a great episode. And Harry Potter and the boys, we got to a phenomenal chapter uh, this week, me and Sammy Garlip. And, uh, it was a chap. The, the book has been leading up to a big twist. That's all we've got. The, the narrator of the book, if you don't know, it's my Harry Potter fan fiction that I wrote when I was 13. The narrator of the book consistently says that there is a big twist coming in the book. And last week's chapter, we did get that big twist. Now, I'm not going to spoil it for you, but I did want to play some of Sam's reaction uh, when he found out the big twist. No way. <laughs> no way. That's a good twist. Is that right? I guess so. So. My God. Is that a good twist? That is good. That is a that big, is actually that's good a twist. big twist. <laughs> yeah. A very, very, very big twist. It was such a crazy episode of the craziest podcast in the country. And then. The other thing uh, is the YouTube channel, short clips and, um, you know, 10, 10, 5 to 10, 5 to 15 minute clips from this pod. If you don't always get to listen to the full app, catch up and just listen to uh, watch whatever you want to watch, topics you want to watch uh, over on the YouTube channel, Radio Mike. For example, you know, 
like from this episode, I'll probably cut up my thoughts on The Flash and my thoughts on Toy Story 5 and my thoughts on Phantom of the Opera and they'll all just be clips. So if you ever want to revisit something, if you ever want to comment on those, just let me know. Um, and yeah, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Nearly on 3,000 subscribers, which is amazing. Would love, we need 18 more. So if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And then of course, finally, um, the other thing, the new brand I've launched, which is Mike Listens on YouTube, Instagram, Mike.Listens, TikTok, Mike.Listens. Uh, every weekday, I am listening to a new album requested and recommended by you guys, my followers and listeners. And uh, just doing written and one minute reviews. That has really grown this week. We have gotten, well, this month, it's basically been going for a month. We've nearly gotten 10,000 views on YouTube, nearly 50 hours of watch time. Would just love a few more subscribers and followers to keep it going, but it's really fun. I've really been enjoying it. And over on the Instagram, I'm just keeping it basically as a diary of everything that I've listened to and just like a grid of all the albums I've listened to just for me to keep track. And I'd love for more suggestions. This week for Mike Listens, I have already done uh, the brand new Paramore album, This Is Why. So hear my thoughts on that. Uh, and then three that were recommended by fans or listeners, uh, Facelift by Alice in Chains, Good Charlotte, the self-titled album from Good Charlotte, and Folly Adar by Fall Out Boy. I think their second or third album. So definitely go and check out Mike Listens. That is pretty much all. If you want any of the bonus pods uh, and you can't be bothered signing up to Patreon, but you want to listen to one of the bonus pods, just send me a dollar, paypal.me slash it's radio mic and say, Mike, I'd love to listen to this week's overflow or this week's pattern mic. Uh, you can still access that content that way. And from there, I think I will leave it be. I'll see you on the overflow if you're a Patreon. I'll see you Friday for the Pat and Mike if you're a Patreon. And uh, yeah, I will see everyone else next week. My name has been Radio Mike. This has been the inside of my mind. Catch you later.